seven great points about the Son of God, looking primarily at this verse, Hebrews 1, 3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by the word of his power, having made purification for our sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Introduction. Bob Allen's commentary says this, and it is this person who has provided purification for sins and taken his seat at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. It's just beyond my understanding. These are the words of God's word, and I trust them. In doing so, it is obvious he has attained an eminence far beyond anything the angels can claim. As might easily be expected in the prologue, the writer struck notes which will be crucial to the unfolding of his argument in the body of the epistle. He implied that God's revelation in the Son has a definitive quality which previous revelation lacked. Moreover, the sacrifice for sins, which such a one makes, must necessarily be greater than other kinds of sacrifices. Finally, the Son's greatness makes preoccupation with the angelic dignitaries entirely unnecessary. So, sorry for the interruption, the phone call, that happens. Moreover, the sacrifice for sins which such a one makes must necessarily be greater than other kinds of sacrifices. Finally, the son's greatness makes preoccupation with angelic dignitaries entirely unnecessary. Though the prologue contains no warning, the, the writer reserves those for later. He carries with it an implicit admonition. This is God's supremely great son. Hear him. In a series of subordinate constructions, which are part of a single sentence in the Greek, the author set forth the son's greatness. The unified structure of the writer's sentence is hidden by the NIV, which breaks it down into several sentences. That's one of the problems with that translation. Sometimes it's a complex sentence, and you leave it that way. This emphasis on the son leads to a series of seven propositions about him, eight if we include verse four. Point one, God appointed the son heir of all things. Whom he appointed heir of all things. Notice that our Lord's humanity is in view here. Not his deity. For he, he being God the Son is an eternally heir of all things. And this is a hard thing when we have uh, God the Trinity. And then we have the addition of perfect humanity to the Son of God. But we read it as scripture presents it. Without editorializing it. The term... Appointed heir, Expositors points out, points to lawful possession, but without indicating in what way that possession is secured. Heir of all things, then is a title of dignity and shows that Christ has the supreme place in all the mighty universe. His exaltation to the highest place in heaven after his work in his humanity, his perfect humanity on earth, was done, did not mark some new dignity by his re-entry into his rightful place. Philippians 2, 5-9, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. That doesn't mean he gave it up. A lot of people say that. One, But made himself nothing in the sense of in his perfect humanity, but taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And... Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Notice that our Lord made himself nothing, set aside the expression of his attributes as God and made himself nothing in comparison, added to himself human likeness and expressed himself as such, even to the point of the ultimate humility of suffering and ignominious death on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And as a result of this obedience, he was exalted in his humanity to the highest place in the universe. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Point two. Through the Son, God alone, God also made the universe. The Son is creator. 
I don't know if I remembered it. Quote John uh, three, uh, John one, one to three. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and God was the Word. And then one, two, and one, then three. There was nothing that was created that was not created by the God, by, by the Word. His Creator, and through Him He also made all things. All things. Forever, an unbroken age, perpetuity of time, eternity, the worlds, universe, periods of time, age. Babylon's commentary. To begin with, the sun is the designated heir of all things. This is obviously as it should be since he also is also their maker, the one through whom he made the universe. The ages also rented the universe. The reference to the sun's airship anticipates the thought of his future reign, of which the writer will say much. Colossians 4, 1, 14, rather, 1, 14 to 20. For he, God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Imagine that. Every single atom, the nucleus. How did all those protons hold together? Science can't figure that one out. If they only would look to God. Things we can explain and understand, that's fine. We'd look to God for the rest. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Note that only God himself can be described as having the fullness of God dwell in him. For that is a fullness in an absolute sense. So the Son of God is God himself. And through him, verse 20, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So, so God the Father appointed his Son heir of all things, for he is creator and savior of all things, and firstborn, in other words, supreme over all of his creation. Point three, being the radiance of God's glory, the glory of God defined. God's glory, the expression of the honor, power, and holiness of God, such expression being a demonstration of God's infinite and absolute attributes, especially including his absolute holiness and righteousness, and his omnipotent power, omnipresence, and omniscience. These things people cite, and I do, they're beyond my comprehension. Even in my resurrection body, I'm sure, these things about God, these words, will be incomprehensible. What a wonder. Ezekiel 10.4 Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple, and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. Certain men at certain times have reflected the glory of God. Exodus 34, when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with them, with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites, what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. The Son of Jesus Christ, 
is stipulated here as ex ex existing as not just reflecting the radiance. So well chosen these words for the writer of Hebrews. The brightness of God's incomparable glory. Notice that apogasma, radiance, having no article stresses quality, that of being the radiance of God's glory as opposed to reflecting it. So God's glory is the, glo is the sun's glory. Therefore the sun existing as the radiance of the glory of God as opposed to one reflecting or participating in the radiance of God's glory is in view. The former testifying to the deity of the Son of God, for only God can exist as the radiance of the glory of God. So well chosen are these words. That our Lord did not just reflect, but actually has, always had, the quality of the glory of God is demonstrated here in a preview of our Lord when he comes again with his glory, the glory of God fully demonstrated and in full view to the universe. There's just no, there, there are some people in, in their humanity that you just wonder, they have no awe of God. They have a rejection of him. And yet, no matter how well he demonstrates his glory in the universe, in the, in the world, in, in the creation of man, the, 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 no one could have created the human body except God and God alone. I talked to atheists about this. And they, they, they just shrugged their shoulders. Oh yeah, it evolved like from a rock or something like that. Just a mind-boggling experience. I'm so glad I've had an opportunity to study. Uh, I'm a little remiss in not reviewing this study that I did, compiled actually, uh, on the book of Hebrews. So, that our Lord did not just reflect, but actually has, always had, the quality of the glory of God is demonstrated here in preview of our Lord when he comes again and his glory, the glory of God, fully demonstrated and in full view to the universe. Luke 9, 26-32 If anyone is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. In their humanities, way back in the first century, I don't know if I could have handled that myself. These disciples were put through a lot, and they, yet they stuck with him. They, they, constantly, their lives are threatened. And, uh, but the, the Lord worked with them in their humanities. And the twelve stuck with him. Compare Matthew 16, 28, 17 to 2. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And we look at Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. Note that our Lord especially demonstrated the glory of God and his humanity in a very key way, living in absolute holiness and righteousness, sinless perfection, in all of his thoughts, words, and deeds, perfectly fulfilling the requirements of the law as a perfect human being so that he could perfectly fulfill his mission to pay the penalty for the sins of the